The Saints run over the Bills. It's a rout, and optimism is growing around New Orleans. Post-game reaction and analysis from Buffalo ahead. LSU surges in the second half. Tulane gets two monster fourth down plays in overtime. And we'll preview the Southland showdown in Hammond Thursday night. Plus, the Pelicans are showing real signs of life. All that coming up tonight on Fourth Down on Four. This is the last word on sports. Fourth Down on Four starts now. In 2009, the Saints looked like Super Bowl contenders from the start. There was no doubt. This season started with great doubt, but now, 10 weeks into the NFL season, the Saints absolutely look like Super Bowl contenders again. I'm Doug Mouton. Welcome to Fourth Down on Four. The Saints beat Buffalo today in every way possible. It was a mauling, as Andrew Doak reports. Be the Saints. Yeah. The Saints be can't be play Saints. defense. Play with yeah. The Saints can't run the ball. Show how hungry we are to get this win. And the Saints certainly can't play in the cold. This team hadn't lost a game at home. That changes today. Yeah. Hey, every season is full of defining moments. Let's make this day a defining moment for us in our quest. Let's go, baby. Yes, yeah, yeah. Which Saints label would you like this team to dispel next? It, it might be the perception of somebody that's unattached to any, like, factual stuff. Have you, have you had a team? Does it sound like I'm taking it a little... I think it's just a little cliche. I think we played well on the road. The weather is the weather, you know, so we didn't, it wasn't even a big thing this week about it's going to be cold, it's going to be cold. I mean, we, we might have looked once and was like, oh man, it's going to be cold, it might rain, all right, whatever. In a dominating road win, the Saints showed shades of black and gold teams of the late 2000s. Plenty of games where you feel like, man, we're efficient, we're efficient. Um, you know, good on first and second down rushing the ball, good in short yard situations, but you know, not where you just felt like it was six, seven yards a pop. You know, that's, I'd say that's pretty rare. The most interesting development, though, with this Saints team is how Sean Payton has orchestrated it. Built to run the football and play defense. Two keys of how you win in January. This is what we aim for. This is what we shoot for. This, well, this is what our goal is, is just be able to um, carry our team on the ground and be able to make plays to put us in positions to win games. I like where our defense is playing. I like our defense mentality. I like the way we take practice. I like the way we take the game, take the field. Um, whatever gets us to this to this mental edge, that's what we need. Come on, defense! Let's go! The Saints were so strong on the ground that their six rushing touchdowns led to zero punts. The first time that combo has happened in the NFL since 1941. I mean, we talked about it all week. We want to, you know, control control the run game and control um, the the field position. I think we did that. Um, just being able to get that first drive off and, and, and really do what we, we've been saying we want to do all week is great. I mean, it's a morale boost. And a big reason for that production, a half-healthy left tackle, Teron Armstead, who said he was a game-time decision. I'm so comfortable when Teron's in the game. I love when Teron's in the game. When, when Teron's out, I'm like, you know, no, not saying anything about our, you know, all our linemen. We have so much good depth. They do such a great job. But Teron, man, he's one of the best tackles in the game. He is the best tackle in the game when he's healthy. Imposing our will on, on imposing defenses, that's, that's what we like to do. We like to put somewhere where they don't want to be. When you got Mark, you got AK, they don't need much. They don't need much. We do our jobs up front, and this can be a repeat occurrence. And for the seventh straight week, the Saints defense proved they are no anomaly. But at this moment in the NFL, the standard, holding the Bills stars of Tyrod Taylor, LaShawn McCoy, and Kelvin Benjamin to just 174 combined yards and zero touchdowns. We were just trying to contain him, man. We know Benjamin. We played against him. Um, we know the type of routes that he that he that he ran in Carolina, and actually ran the same same stuff, man. We kind of held held him to a uh, low yards. We came out and we did what we had to do. We knew that uh, Tyrod Taylor was uh, going to try and scramble. Uh, we kept him in the pocket, made him quarterback, and I don't know how that went, went for him. If I'm honest, I'm just interested to see which label this Saints team kicks next. In Buffalo, Andrew Doak, fourth down on four. All right, good stuff, Andrew. Here's some historical perspective on how unusual this day was for the Saints. In NFL history, six teams have now rushed for at least 295 yards and scored at least six touchdowns rushing. You see the list. The Bears twice in 1940, the Giants, Rams, and Browns. But note, no one had done it in 60 years. 
That's how good the Saints offensive line and running backs were Sunday. Now back to Buffalo now for a little postgame analysis. After it was over, Andrew caught up with one of the best who covers the Saints. I right, joined now by Joel Erickson of The Advocate. If you haven't read his stuff, go and check him out. The Saints just a dominating win today. D most dominating of the season by far, I, I would say. What do you think worked so well for him? Well, really, it was everything. There there's just not, there have been games where there's been, you know, something to nitpick or something like that. There's, there's really nothing that went wrong in this game. It, you know, they gave up one big run. That's really the only thing the defense did until the final drive when the game was way out of contention. They converted a bunch of third and longs that, you know, you got in situations where you should get off the field and Michael Thomas makes a catch. The running game was unreal. There were holes big enough that Alvin Kamara, Kamara fell down once yeah. and still got up and got 11 yards and fell down in the hole. It, it was a really complete performance and really the kind of performance you don't see in the NFL. Like this, this felt more like a college game between an SEC team and an FCS team. It was, it was really dominant. I mean, the fans were leaving early in the third quarter. Yeah, uh, no doubt about it. You look at the rushing stats, they had 298 yards rushing. The Bills only had 198 total yards on the day, so they out, outgained them just in the rushing category by 100. Between Alvin Kamara and, and Mark Ingram, they just obviously had a day. Do you attribute that to the offensive line more so than anything and, and Teron Armstead being back? I, I think... I think, well, Armstead and Warford, that helps. But I think the other thing was there, there were some moves they made. Uh, Ingram had some really nice cuts in the hole uh, today where, where he, 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 if he goes one way, he doesn't have a gain. If he goes the other way, he gets a big one. Kamara, Kamara has this thing he does when it looks like he's going to get cut off on the outside and he still gets around the corner. Uh, it Really just a total, I mean, 300 rushing yards, it's going to be a total performance. But it was kind of everything. And then towards the end in the second half, like the holes were just unbelievably huge. We were... We were joking that you could put an offensive lineman back there and they still get a couple. Uh, you could bring Deuce McAllister back and he'd probably be able to get 40, 50 year rushing yards in this game. So it, it kind of a total team thing and it, it does help. It helps to have your whole offensive line back. It helps to have a guy like Armstead who gets out on the edge and really creates problems for secondary people and linebackers. And you're, you're starting to see what a good running game can do for the Saints. Yeah, this time of year when the environment's cold, you're on the road running the football and defense travel defensively. They were stout. Uh, really, they only uh, held LaShawn McCoy to 49 yards rushing. They bottled him up. 20, or I think it was actually 36 of those yards came on that long run on the first drive. He really just didn't even ha have time to breathe today, it seemed like. Yeah, and the key really there is game tackling. He's a guy who, his 36-yard run came on a play that Alex Okafor was actually in position, and he did what LaShawn McCoy does and made a cut, and he, he, Okafor needed some help. The rest of the game, there were plenty of guys there. and. and even bigger for the defense, they did it without A.J. Klein. He left the game in the first right, yeah. in the first quarter with an ankle injury. Manti Teo comes in, plays well. And the other thing was three and outs. I mean, they got three and out after three and out after three and out. Somewhere in the middle of the fourth quarter, the Bills had only run 34 offensive plays. And that's, a, that's an astronomically low number for an for a offense to run. Defense liked the offense. There weren't the big plays, so maybe it didn't stick out as much, but the defense was really just as dominant. I appreciate it, Joel. Joel Erickson of The Advocate. Go check his stuff out. Really great stuff. All right, Doug, here in Buffalo, we'll send it back to you. Coach Ken uh, came in, said a few things, and we just had to get our stuff going in the second half. That's exactly what we did. The halftime wake-up call came, and LSU now heads into its final two games rolling. Next, how the offense changed the game. How Tulane hopes to use its overtime momentum in its final two. And we'll look ahead to the Southland Showdown in Hammond Thursday night. And later, how it's coming together for the Pelicans. Ahead on 4th Down on 4. LSU did have an Alabama hangover Saturday against Arkansas. Fortunately for the Tigers, it only lasted a half. The Tigers woke up in the second half, tore through the Razorbacks, and kept the possibility of a 10-win season alive. The second half was sort of what we expected. Darius Geis ran for 99 yards in the half and three touchdowns. LSU outscored Arkansas 26-3. It took two quarters to get there, but it was the dominance you'd expect playing a team that's now 1-5 and five in the SEC. 
But along the way, we saw some new stuff, like an intermediate passing game. The second half started with this 19-yarder to Stefan Sullivan, and that drive also included this 15-yarder to Torrey Carter. They were taking away a lot of the deep things after the first touchdown, so we was hitting them for quick passes. And you can't come in the game and just throw it deep uh, every time. So. Doing that was able to open up the run game some and also let us get uh, deep uh, behind them again. So I think that's a big part of any offense, and I'm glad we was able to execute it. The fourth quarter began with DJ Chark just running past Arkansas for an easy 68-yard touchdown. Chark only caught four passes Saturday, but for 130 yards and two touchdowns. It's a great feeling. Uh, me and Danny worked very hard this week. Um, just me and him trying to get things to work on our deep passes, uh, and we was able to show it. While the offense was piling up points, Greedy Williams and the LSU defense was successfully getting off the field. It was the half of football LSU needed, heading into its final two regular season games. Nobody panicked. We know um, we had to just get our stuff going. We started off flat. Coach Ken, uh, came in, said a few things, and we just had to get our stuff going in the second hand. That's exactly what we did. We got the recipe to win. I mean, you know, honestly, the way we played Alabama was the recipe to win. You know, we might not have won the game, but I feel like we executed our recipe the energy. You know, we're fresh, you know, and we outlast teams in the fourth quarter. That's just how I feel. You know, that's how I feel about the D-line. Our D-line outlasts any offensive line in the fourth quarter. LSU now takes that recipe to Knoxville, where Tennessee just fired its coach. Butch Jones is out. The Volunteers are winless in the SEC this season. Ten wins and maybe a top 15 national finish are still possible for LSU. Meanwhile, Tulane kept its bowl hopes alive with an overtime win Saturday night at East Carolina. Tulane is now 4-6. and six. They must win their last two beginning Saturday at home against Houston to become bowl eligible. And it took two huge fourth downs in overtime to stay alive. <laughs> Tulane got the ball first in overtime and couldn't get a first down on its first three plays. So on fourth and one from the ECU 16, Willie Fritz opted to go for it. Jonathan Banks kept and went 16 yards for a touchdown. On East Carolina's second play in overtime, Hussein Howe took it inside the Green Wave 10. But three plays later, the Pirates had a fourth and goal at the Tulane one and Ray John Marbley in the Tulane defense held. They came out in a power football formation and had the backs in there and they're under center. And, you know, and uh, just a really nice job of game tackling and keeping them about two feet from the goal, uh, the end zone. Ray John got yeah. together, he got us together, the defense <laughs> together, he said, hey, leave it all out here right now. So uh, that's what we did, we came out, we played for one another, we got it done. Marbley led Tulane with a dozen tackles. Donnie Lewis had an incredible six pass breakups. And Dontrell Hilliard continued to show, even with a great tradition of running backs, he's one of Tulane's best ever. Hilliard ran 28 times for a career high, 189 yards and two touchdowns. I told Coach before, I'm going to give him my best. I'm going to get all I got. Regardless of uh, the fact of what it is, I'm going to give you all. So it mean a lot to me. You're a great job by the guys uh, running the football. We had, we had over 300 yards rushing, and, and uh, you know, I thought Don Trill did a good job. I thought Banks did a good job of really reading the option. Banks only threw for 110 yards, and he had two interceptions, but also 96 yards and two touchdowns on the ground. In a game where Willie Fritz pulled out all the stops, like this third-quarter fake punt, Glenn Couillette made a nice throw. It led to a touchdown in the Green Wave's first road win of the season. This win means a lot. Uh, we're hoping that we can take this momentum and carry it on next week. Uh, we're just taking it one game at a time right now. This is like tremendous like uh, motivation, tremendous like momentum that we can take over to next week going against Houston. Um, our biggest thing is going to take it on move to the next game, enjoy this win, and just go stay focused and make sure we go finish the season all right. It's still an uphill battle for Tulane. The Green Wave will now play a 6-3 and three Houston team at home and then a 6-4 and four SMU team on the road. And they must win both to go bowling. Thursday night in Hammond, Southeastern and Nichols close out their regular seasons. For the Lions, it's a chance to finish with a winning record for the fourth time in the last five seasons under Ron Roberts. And it's a chance to spoil Nichols' bid to get into the NCAA tournament. 
minute. Here's a run up the middle, and here's a Nickel State touchdown from 20 yards out. Saturday in Nacogdoches, Nichols took care of business with a ferocious running game. The Colonels ran it 62 times for 418 yards. They dominated up front on both sides of the ball. Against Stephen F. Austin, they more than doubled the Lumberjacks in total yards. It was the Colonels' sixth straight win. 34 to 13 was the final. They're now eight and two overall. They're definitely in the NCAA tournament conversation, but they're definitely not a lock. The FCS tournament only takes 24 teams. That's 24 out of 124 FCS schools. Last year, the Southland Conference got two bids, and right now the Colonels are third best in the conference. Sam Houston State and Central Arkansas are ranked third and fourth in the country in the FCS poll. They'll both get in. Nichols is 17th right now. So a win over Southeastern should be enough to get them in. The Lions, meanwhile, had a bye this week. They are 5-5 five and five now, and they would love a chance to spoil the Colonels' NCAA chances. They kick off at 6 o'clock Thursday night in Strawberry Stadium. The Pelicans have now won four of their last five. Ricardo LeCompte looks into why the Pelicans are rolling. And later, four local schools take home state volleyball championships on fourth down on four. We're less than 20 games into the NBA season. The Pelicans have not had Rajon Rondo on the floor yet, but it certainly appears they're beginning to figure things out. New Orleans has the best big man duo in basketball, and it looks like Drew Holiday and Etwan Moore and the rest of the supporting cast is learning how to fit, as Ricardo LeCompte reports. Holiday, he's got AD. How about that hammer? Over the 500 mark once again, and based on their play recently, the Pelicans may actually stay there. I thought we found a way uh, where we didn't play our best basketball to still come up with a win. New Orleans grinded out wins during its recent four-game road trip. Wins in Dallas and Chicago on back-to-back -back nights, followed by a tough victory at Indiana. Anthony Davis and DeMarcus Cousins shouldering the load like they have for the Pels during this first part of the season. Got it! The road trip ended, however, with a four-point loss to the Raptors. But it was a game the Pelicans were in throughout. We hung in, we hung in, and just didn't make a couple of plays down the stretch. That uh, I think anytime you're on the road and in the last two minutes you give yourself an opportunity to win the game, uh, you're still playing pretty good. And the loss was very encouraging for the fact that the role players stepped up when AD and Boogie struggled to get it going. Drew Holiday played his best game of the year, scoring a game-high 34, four points off his career best. Drew had it going through, so we're trying to, you know, feed the high hand. Um, and then when it's time for us to, you know, make plays, you know, guys make plays. Just to be able to, uh, when they double down or even sometimes triple team, to be able to be available in the right place and, and, and knock a shot in, uh, it's getting more comfortable in knowing where they want to pass and all that. They've got to be able to understand that if they're going to try to play us, where they take those guys completely away, that we do have the ability for other people to step up. And that's the production the Pels need outside of the front court duo. Drew getting his buckets and making smart decisions on the floor. Etwan Moore and Dante Cunningham making an impact on both ends of the court. And when you get that, to put alongside Davis and Cousins' production, you get results, like in the first win of the homestand against the Clippers. The Pels also expecting to get Rajon Rondo back at the end of the week. New Orleans beginning to figure out the formula for winning basketball. And that may just keep them over 500 for good. Ricardo LeCompte reporting for fourth down on four. Yes, I know it's early, but here's how the West stands now. Houston and Golden State are the class of the conference. Denver's a surprise. San Antonio, Memphis, Minnesota, the Pelicans sit seventh right now. And that's without Rondo. Portland is eighth. But note, for now, Oklahoma City and Utah are on the outside looking in. That figures to change. We're back with more. Fourth down on four in a minute. 
Louisiana hands out five state volleyball championships. Local schools won four of those five titles. The Mount Carmel Cubs took home the Division I state championship. Ellie Holtzman led the way. She is the Gatorade Player of the Year. Vanderbilt Catholic in Homa won in Division Three. Pope John Paul II in Slidell won in Division Four, And Country Day in Metairie won in Division Five. Congratulations to our four state volleyball championship teams. And one week into the prep football playoffs, we have exactly 31 local schools still alive, still hoping to get to the Superdome in four weeks. And we will have all the second round playoff action on fourth down Friday. That, of course, Friday night at 1015 here on Channel 4. The Saints, LSU, Tulane, Nichols, and the Pelicans all won this weekend. New Orleans gets Washington in the Superdome Sunday. The Redskins lost to Minnesota today. They've lost three of four. It's a chance for the Saints to get their eighth in a row. For Ricardo LeCompte, Andrew Doak, producer Danny Rockwell, photographer Adam Ney, and all of us here at Eyewitness Sports, I'm Doug Mouton. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week on Fourth Down on Four.